neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that you won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and BB King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcellino. Well, good day to you, Mr. <laughs> good day to you, Mr. Marcellino. <laughs> oh, what a day it is, huh? It is. It's a good day. Yeah, it's a great day. We got uh we got some uh, stuff we're doing and we And got, then more stuff we're and doing. Then more stuff and then and then a little bit more. It's a day full of stuff. But here's the thing. There's we, a thing. There is a thing. Oh, We've got thing to me. thank our listeners. Um, I, as I, always. Oh yeah, as we always. we are getting some uh, some great uh, comments on Facebook. Mm-hmm. We're getting some great stuff on Twitter. Yes. Uh, we had a gentleman go through PayPal. I'm not going to mention his name uh, because we'll thank him privately. Uh, but dumped uh, a good amount of money into our account, and I I had to do a double take. I was like, Ooh, something's wrong. <laughs> like i want to check with this guy before we actually uh you know so uh before we take care of bills before right. we do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> may have to send a refund um See, mick hasn't even told me who it is so whoever you are thank you very yes, much thank you very thank much you. i forgot hopefully I, we you're enjoying the show so yeah yeah well uh if i'm not mistaken and uh i have to there's check. a 50 50 chance yes but i have i have to check <laughs> i have to check um I think he commented on our first show and also de- donated a, a large sum of money, which is crazy because, I mean, it's like we got, you know, 60 some shows. Yeah. He's at one and he's like, got to give him money. Wow. We didn't even have it then. No, we didn't. We, we didn't. didn't. Have we, we, no, that we time. did not. We did not have that banner then. So yeah. thank, thank you very yes. much. And, um, and, 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 and happy listening. Yes, Happy and listening. and and for everybody else, I mean, if you don't want to donate through PayPal, uh, which we do appreciate, you can go through our Amazon banner, right? And that doesn't even cost you extra. You get what you want for the price that you get, which is a good price always from always. Amazon. And then uh, they kick us back a little bit uh, off of that sale. It's all good. It is all good. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, and I keep forgetting to do this. We have an Instagram page and I've been posting to Instagram to, uh, you know, because it's the newer medium that everybody's taking to the new social media. Right, right, So um, follow us on Instagram. We're amps underscore and the word and underscore axes. Boy, I couldn't have made it any more confusing. Uh, But I I think it rejected the ampersand. Okay. Uh, So uh, it's so it's amps underscore Underscore and the the word. word and. Yes underscore axis find us there follow us there i follow back yes Um, you do i do apologize to people that have been following us on twitter Mm -hmm. Uh, we've maxed out how many people we can follow oh right and i had to cut the number back right so 2000 is the number that you can follow who knew i didn't know right so we hit it and i had to i had to unfollow some people that I, I went through and I tried no to offense. find. No offense. Yeah, no offense. I just tried to find people that didn't maybe look like they were doing much. Okay. Right? So I unfollowed totally those. Totally understood. And if I'm not following you, um, I apologize, but we want to keep that open for when we have guests We and they follow right. us. We want to be able to, you know, follow them back. Yes. If we whether, don't follow them. Whether they're players them. or manufacturers yeah. or, you know, whatever. It's, you know. Like uh, Kristen. Uh, oh yes, yeah. We, we yeah, yeah. She f- now follows us. We follow her. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, she but we did do mention that she had a very good time and felt very welcomed. Oh show, yeah, yeah. So. It was very relaxed. I mean, when yeah. you listen to that interview, it's very. It, it, she, what a great girl. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just a great kid. Totally, totally. <laughs> yes, and um, so parents did well. Yes, <laughs> and 
God, can she shred? <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I wanted to mention something to you. Um, I, you know, I, I've talked about Eddie Trunk's podcast. Yes. It's a great podcast. It's a little bit different than this. I mean, Eddie is a true fan. He's not a musician. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't know about this side. Like, we go deep, you know, and we see it in our reviews. By the way, thank you for the five-star reviews out on uh, iTunes. We're getting those, too. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's enough of that. But, <laughs> uh, so, um, but Eddie, you know, he has musicians on, mostly metal guys from the 80s, 90s, and even now. Right. Um, and he... Uh, you know, he he covers the stories. He goes a little bit where we kind of go back. We find out their past and we bring them up and then we get to where we are now. And then right. we, we get into the equipment piece. That's kind of like our format that we've been doing, you know, pretty much for, for, a, while, the, yeah. for a while. And if they run long, then we do two parts or whatever. Sure. Well, Eddie had on Jakey Lee cool. the other day. Cool. And uh, I recommend that everybody go and listen to that episode because he gets into the dirt um with about Ozzy and and Sharon Osbourne. Oh really? Well, if you look, he has no writing credits on Bark of the Moon. Huh. And what they did was noticed. they kind of they kind of hooked him. Now, some would say, well, if he was hooked, why would he stay around for the second album, right? Um it's Ozzy. It, it, it's know, Ozzy and it's also a paycheck and right. you know that that and, and you're doing what you want to do. I mean Exactly. You know, so what happened was on the first album, and if you listen to the episode, he'll tell it, you know, a lot longer, you know, that more detail. But basically, uh, they sent him out to the studio. He was trying to get the deal worked out and they just kept stalling on the deal. He went out, finished all of his guitar parts. And then Sharon came up to him and said, you're not getting any writing credits. You, you're you getting paid mm -hmm. this. No, no extra. Right, right. And uh, and that's it. There's no mailbox money for you. And he was like, uh oh you know like what do i do he yeah. said they told him flat out if he walked away uh they would have another guitar player come in and re-record all of his guitar parts mm -hmm. so uh hey he, look you got to record with ozzy you got to yeah. go out on tour but then you know. uh the next album he had his you know he said the deal was worked out way before the album was produced well, look, and that's he why he stuck around yeah yeah that's why he stuck around uh, was that shot in the dark was the name of that, okay. that album okay. so it was bark of the, bark moon, of the moon and then shot, and then shot, shot in the, in the dark, dark. Right. yeah so it but it was an interesting um it was an interesting interview and and jake is one of these guys you know you associate him with the ozzy thing and you associate him almost as a shredder he actually back in the day when he uh spectraflex did mm -hmm. an ad a full page ad in like guitar world you remember that ad i do and what was sitting in the background buddha that's right. It was a twin master. Yeah, it was a Buddha guy way back yeah. then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was that was a pretty nice little tip of the hat there to you. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, you would associate him with, you know, stacks of whatever. And, and right. to see that, see that little twin master was cool. Man. Yeah. 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 That was that was uh, that was a, a nice tip of the hat from him to uh, to us. Yeah. And uh, we didn't. I don't think we knew that that was going to happen until we saw the ad because he, you know, he was a Buddha guy. You know, we yeah. knew him through, you know, of course, yeah. dealing with him. But um I don't know that we knew that was going to happen until we saw the end. That was so cool to you know flip open like a whatever it was a guitar player or something. And yeah, see the whole, yeah. The whole floor full of pedals and stuff. And him with that cable around his neck. Right, right. <laughs> and, a, and a Buddha amp in the background. Yeah. It's Twin Master. So, so it, it was cool. you know, it's an interesting. So thank you, Jakey. Well, yeah. we should have him on. We should have him on. Yeah. He's a great guy. And the uh, the story that is just amazing is uh, he just was like, no, nah, I'm not. I'm done. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. He just disappeared. And uh, it wasn't until uh, some guys that, you know, that he knows uh, got him to come back in. And now they're doing this. Uh, oh, God, it's uh, something dragon. And I apologize. I forget the name of it. Red Star Dragon, I want to say. I don't know. I, I'd have to look it up. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway. We'll, we'll, so, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll make good on that. Right. But uh, so anyway, he um, he said that this is probably the last uh, like metal album that he'll do. He said he wants to do something where he can just go from, um, you know, a jazzy type tune to EDM to like a hard rocking song. It's really funny because before you said that, I'm thinking, is he going to do the Skolnick thing and go, you know, like a jazz trio? Uh, yeah, yeah, you no. Know? <laughs> no, he just, he said he wants to cover whatever he feels like covering at that moment. He wants to write it and, and that'll be a song to the album. Why not? And I, yeah, I mean, it's. 
you know, it's he's, music. It's you yeah. should be free to do what you want. You and, know? and he's paid his dues. I mean, the guy, you know, sure, you know, that guy had a rough going. I, like I said, there was a, uh, you know, there was the fans were not that warm to him when he was an Aussie. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> he, uh, you know, he got a little bit of a backhand, you know, and and it and he's not a bad player. He's a really oh no, good he's a player. He's, and, you know, I mean, you know, you can't be a bad player. And play in a band with Ozzy and record with Ozzy. No, you know, that camp just, will not just take anyone. Right. I mean, you have to be of a certain caliber. Yeah. You know, they're all different. They're all, they all have different styles. Yes. But they're all of a certain caliber. Yeah. You know, I mean, come on, you know, and I really, it's so funny, man. I mean, I hear people dissing people like Jake and all that, you know, because mm-hmm. he's not this person or whatever, you know, he's there. Where are you? Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not there. You're not there. I have no right to diss the dude. I don't think you do either. Uh, no. You know, it's like, really. Um, I, I think, you know, and I, I just I, that that really, really upsets me sometimes because this person has dedicated themselves to doing what they want to do and being the player they want to be. And they they find themselves in that position you know, by in by no mistake, you know, I mean, yeah. they've worked their way into that position. You know, the only people that that have the, any right to criticize someone like that is someone. And I don't even know why they would do that, but someone that was offered that position and turned it down for some reason. That means you're yeah. equally you're in that camp. You're equally as good. And maybe you can talk on the same level. Other than that. I think people should just shut up and listen. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and you you listen to the, the especially, well, either album. I don't care which one. He's doing some crazy stuff. There's YouTube videos now of him, like, at, I guess at a club, and maybe it was like a, a, a meet and greet type thing where he kind of okay. like did a little bit of a seminar. Mm-hmm. And he goes, this is how I've seen everybody play Bark at the Moon, right? And he does the riff. He goes... That isn't how I play it at all. He goes, I play it like this. I remember seeing this. And he actually, the it's the craziest stretch mm-hmm. that your hand could do. I, nobody could invent that. I mean, he, he you know, it was it was very he, he bizarre. Just, he he decided that that voicing sounded best. Oh yeah, you know, right? And that, that's how everybody invents the things that they play. But it's so funny how he was showing the differences, and he goes. I guess it's okay, he goes, but if you want to do it the way it's done, he goes, you know, here's here's the real way. Right. And when I saw it, I was like, yeah, the other way looks so much easier. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But That's it's, why it's, everybody went It's all way. about voicing, and it's yeah. all about, you know, that oh, that guy sounds so unique playing that. Yeah. And, and you know, and think, that's why. Think about that time, too. That was a time when you had to, you had to deepen, you had to dig in the bag of stuff. And pull it out and just keep everybody wondering. You right. know, Ed, Ed, Eddie was doing all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, making people think that he, he had extra pickups in his guitars and he, oh, you yeah. know, the whole Variac thing. Like he, when he did interviews, he made it sound like you could never obtain anything that he was doing. Right. Equipment wise, because he used some guy out in the middle of the Mojave Desert and come to find out it wasn't. The story was made up, most of it. Yeah, yeah. He had heard about it, but he had never really gone through with it. Yeah, like Jose Arandondo, like <laughs> yeah. super modified his amps and everything. Yeah, and no. No, they're pretty damn stock. Yeah. You know, yeah. And years later, he confessed to it. Mm-hmm. He said, no, 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 it was just a good amp, and I turned it on 10. And <laughs> I still think there was a Distortion Plus in his rack. You never know. <laughs> you never know. I mean, you know. I've been told that. <clears throat> uh, you know, I've never been able to verify it, but I've been told that. Nah. So, you know, but you know what? Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, if you're good enough to come up with something unique that other people are trying to figure out how you like Carlos Alomar, sure, same thing. You know, it's, it's <laughs> you know people are trying to figure out how he did what he did. That's what makes a player unique. I mean, you know, I don't care how many scales you know. I don't, I, you know, I don't care if you can play jazz or classical or, and if you can and you do, that's great. Yes. But you know, these people found something that set them apart f- from from the norm, mm-hmm. and that's why they are where they are. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, that originality is something that will put you over the top. Right. I, you know, I have no comment other to, than to sit back and listen. Exactly. So, so with that, with that, we I got, think I think we're gonna bring in a 
guest now. Yeah. <laughs> and and here's the cool part. Yeah. What? Well, uh, yeah. There, his management contacted us. Cool. Which kind of looped me for a little bit. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. And every now and then we get this. So it, it, when it does, I kind of get oh, a little. You know, sometimes we reach out and sometimes I get a little you know, tingle they, when they that happens because it's like, hey, look at that. So people yeah, well, are people are listening and they're talking. Right. Right. And that's good. That's it. Yes. Um, you know, this is one time where you like being talked about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, yeah. we will we will bring in our guest and we will talk about a plethora of things. And uh, we'll be right back with uh, the um, rhythm guitarist, keyboardist, um, uh, harmonica right. player and vocalist. And, of, and, and other things. And other things. <laughs> a producer, engineer. It's a, you know, we'll talk about a couple of things, but... Yeah. Um, We'll be right back with um, all these, uh, all of these elements from the band Great White. There you go. We'll be back with Mr. Michael Lardy. This is Kristen Capolino, and you're listening to Amps and Axes. And we're back, and without further ado, we bring you Mr. Michael Lardy. Michael, how are you? I'm doing great this afternoon. How are you guys doing? Very well, doing very good, well. Man. Thanks for taking the time with us. Never a problem. Awesome, awesome. So, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we kind of teased it a little bit that you are the, uh, rhythm guitarist, keyboard player, vocalist, harmonica player, and have done engineering and production for great white and other people. But, um, and, and we'll, we'll get up to that, but I always like to start a little bit at the beginning. So what, what put the musical bug into Mr. Michael Lardy? When, when, and where did you start? Where are you from and what brought you into this business? Well, I grew up in Northern California. I think one of the biggest things that I remember uh, growing up um, was seeing uh, the Beatles and Ed Sullivan. It was crazy. You know, my, my parents were already grooming me to be a doctor because I could actually re read uh, when I was four years old. So they already had medical books for me and everything. And then I saw John Lennon on, uh, on Ed Sullivan and I, I was done. I was over. I was cooked. Uh, <laughs> That and that's you know when you turn around and you have that wide-eyed look and you look at your folks and they and you go that's what I'm going to do and they go uh, isn't that cute <laughs> <laughs> so you know I never varied from that never had a regular job uh, you know through ups and downs uh, you know I've made a living at it for uh, 40 years now uh, you know 10 years prior to being a great white I started working in clubs when I was 15 so. Um, wow. I guess I was kind of destined to, to go that way. But yeah, it was definitely the Beatles that uh, flipped my head sideways. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned working in clubs. Um, were you a guitarist at that point or, or you know, multi playing keyboards? or? I was uh, primarily playing guitar, but uh, starting to add keyboards to it at that point. By the time I was 16, I was playing about, about two thirds, one third. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And this is still in uh, California? Yeah, well, I grew up in Northern California in Sacramento, oh, okay. and um, it was, uh, you know, a great place to grow up, certainly not the mecca for the music industry, so uh, I realized that uh, at 19, I had to uh, hightail it down to Southern California and get uh, plugged into uh, what was going on down there. Nice. nice. Wow. Where, did you, uh, where did you wind up, and what was your uh, first experience down there like? Well, you know, ha having come up and, and already gone to engineering school as well, because I always wanted to learn how to be an engineer to help translate what I wanted to get down, uh, or at least, you know, be able to better communicate with, um, with what was going on with uh, studio um, scenario. So mm -hmm. uh, I went down and ended up at Redondo Beach because that was the one neighborhood that seemed somewhat sane to me. I checked out Hollywood and the valley and just went, eh, nah, this is not working for me. So, uh, turns out I'm quite the beach guy and, uh, nice. ended up living there for 25 years. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, I started working in a studio, um, and got a gig as an engineer first. And then they found out that I played, uh, you know, guitar and keyboard. So I started to do, um, session work as a player in addition to working as an engineer. So to me, it was always kind of a hand in hand thing um, and came up about the same rate, you know, working with other people in the studio as an engineer or a musician and just kind of like elevating that whole thing. Not unlike the way I met Great White. Nice, nice. Wow. Where, where did you do your um, audio engineering schooling? 
Uh, it was up here in Sacramento. It was uh, the uh, Recording Institute of America. It wasn't, uh, you know, nobody had heard of Full Sail or anything like that at that point. Oh, so yeah. it was basically teaching the same principles that uh, they taught in the 60s and 70s. And it was great for me because I got to learn so much about um, what was going on with, you know, really how to place a microphone. You know, how to use equalization, uh, do things that uh, so many of the young engineers coming up haven't uh, an effing clue about how to do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. and I, at the same time, I also went to electronics uh, school, so I filled in all the gaps. You wow. know, I knew how the circuit worked in addition to uh, being able to... Um, figure out you know what microphone to use on that piano or that snare drum and uh so it was kind of like everything was kind of coming up at the same time kind of hand in hand and, and i really feel like i got a, a great education that that's really a, yeah, that's a cool an all-encompassing you know education to, to go out there with i mean hey look if all else fails you can tech you know <laughs> <laughs> you know i t it's so funny we'll get into this when we talk about a regular day for this but uh, yeah there is there is still some tech and going on <laughs> so when you when you finally got to the studio and you, and you started working there um was it still two track at that point were you still were you running tape uh, no the yeah oh yeah the first the first machine i learned on was no, i mean i know i'm at two inch not two track i'm sorry yeah no the first machine i learned on was a, was a 16 track and uh and then when I moved to Southern California, the place I started working at was a 16 track. And then we eventually, uh, you know, upgraded the 24 track. It was I always like the, the juju that was in this machine. We bought uh, one of the 3M machines from the Village Recorder that they recorded uh, Asia on. So oh. by Steely Dan. So I always thought that was good mojo in that machine. <laughs> oh, yeah. There I imagine go. so. That's very, <laughs> very cool. What uh, what studio was that? It was called Media Art, and then eventually um, uh, a friend of mine that I was performing in a band with at the time, um, by some you know strange coincidence, uh, the guy that he was working construction for knew that he was a musician and owned this studio over in Redondo Beach, and he found out that uh, it was going into receivership, so he said, oh, I really don't want to sell the business because it's a good tax write-off for me. So... Um, I think I'm gonna, you know, I th I think I'm gonna give it to you, Win. You know, and uh, oh Win didn't really know how to engineer at that point, so he's like, "You got to come to work for me, and we we can do this thing together." And and uh, that's the studio, uh, Total Access, where I actually met Great White. Wow, what an opportunity, <laughs> man! Wow, that is nuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So you know, hey, hey, come work for me. Somebody just gave me a studio. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those, those strange occurrences that you just, you don't roll the dice and think that's ever, anything like that's ever going to happen. But right. it actually did, you know. <laughs> that so, is crazy, man. Yeah, and it, 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 one of the cool things about that, when Great White came in to record their first uh, full-length album for EMI, uh, Michael Wagner had produced that record, and I was working there as a staffer. And, you know, I developed a friendship with, with Mark, um, and they found out that I play guitar and keyboards, and I ended up singing some backgrounds, uh, background vocals on that record. Um, they went off to do the Judas Priest tour in 84, and when they came back uh, in 85 to start recording Shot in the Dark, uh, they were dropped by EMI and trying to get re-signed with a label, and uh, it was at that point where uh, the their manager at the time, Alan Niven, um, saw something in my, you know, uh, future contribution to the band um, and suggested that we start jamming together and and uh, ended up started writing together. And it was just the coolest organic thing about how everything happened. It wasn't like I set out to say, I'm going to be in this band or were they looking for a keyboard rhythm guitarist? No. You know, mm. it was just one of those very organic things that happened. Mm. Um, so, you know, and... It, when we when we started to record uh, Once Bitten uh, in 87, or actually late 86, they, they all turned to me and said, well, you know you're in the band now, right? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> fine. Okay. <laughs> when, when they initially went out uh, on that support tour, they went out as a four-piece? Yes. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, that was the album that um, my friend Donnie Houck, uh 
I, I, I know he won't listen to this. He hasn't <laughs> sang in years, but uh, he turned me on to it. And I was like, who are these guys, man? It was that and Vandenberg. Those two, uh, oh, okay. the, the very first albums there, he, he let me hear them. And I was like, wow. And it's a different sound off of that first album. You know, it was yeah. interesting because, you know, that was what was going on on the strip at that point. So it was kind yeah. of like that was the influential aspect of, you know, where Mark was going, you know, as far as writing riffs. Uh, the interesting thing was in between uh, session work or him warming up in the morning, uh, I'd hear him play and he'd be playing like Johnny Winter and Eric Clapton riffs. And I'm going, dude. You know, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, you're playing all this, you know, eighth note, you know, 130 beat per minute, like heavy duty stuff. And, and you know how when you watch a guitar player play, sometimes you can actually see their soul emanate from their from their energy mm. uh, when they play. <laughs> yeah. When Mark plays blues riffs, I feel like he's extending his spirit out into the cosmos. So... I, w I would say to him, dude, I mean, this this is the stuff you should be playing, man. That's what this yeah. is what I feel you, man. You yeah. know, and and it was just kind of ironic that we kind of like started to go in that direction, uh, partially on Shot in the Dark and most assuredly on What's Bitten with uh, the long form song uh, Rock Me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. That, that changed yeah, it. Changed. Yeah, that's. that's you know, it's, 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 sometimes you're just meant to play a certain thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. you know, it's intrinsic <laughs> into yeah. your DNA, man. Right. You perfectly believe that. Oh, absolutely. Unless you're Guthrie Govan. <laughs> 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 and then you're, you, it's, you just name it. He does it. <laughs> he, he's meant to play like Guthrie Govan. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or there's guys like John Five that can play everything. And yeah, John Five, man. Yeah, it's all perfect and, you know... Um, so, you know, there's there's lots of guys that can do everything, but, you know, many guys that, that come up that are, you know, you know, true in terms of their approach to their craft and their instrument. Yeah, That's one yeah. thing I will always, you know, say about Mark, certainly one of the more underrated guitar players, because when the guy bends a note and he's doing it, I'm feeling him. I mean, one of the coolest things about recording with Mark is sometimes he likes to wear the headphones so he can really hear the, 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 the sound of the pick as he's playing and stuff. So, you know, I'm monitoring lowly as we're, you know, as we're going along. And, and sometimes I'm monitoring low enough where I can actually hear Mark singing the riffs <laughs> in, in, in a slight, you know, advance to the note he's actually going to play. So he's going when he's playing. It's, it's awesome, you know, to like hear him just emote what is coming from his brain through his heart down his hand to the fretboard. It's just one of those things you just yeah. go, man, this guy's got it. That's too cool. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it's it's it, it's it's obviously spontaneous, but it's he's there. he's thinking of it right before it happens yep. you know well, that's so cool here, here i'll give you a handful of guys that do that robert cray right okay richie cotton oh yeah george yeah, benson yeah. george yeah. benson is insane yeah the way he does it and uh hendrix hendrix used to do it all the time they just they just sing it as they're playing it man. yeah yeah and it's like uh, how are you doing that well i mean that's <laughs> that's an ultimate familiarity with the fretboard you think and your throat you know? <laughs> well, you know and that's a thing too you know you talk about i mean you know i bow down to to guys like vi and and eddie van halen and all all those guys that can burn and rip up and down a neck but at the same time i think it's a little harder for me personally to sing in my head the solos that they both do guys like mark yeah. guys yeah. like Hendrix, guys like Mick Jones, Ted Nugent. I mean, these are all guys that their solos are so memorable. Oh, yeah. That it's melodically plotted out to a point of like they're making another part of a song that's just important as the melody when the singer is singing. Absolutely. And, and, and most of the best, most recognizable solos, and, I, and I'm not sure who said this first, but I'm sure a lot of, of players say this. 
it's, you know, the most memorable solos are ones that anybody can sing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and, and that's that's when it just translates more to the masses. And, and that's that's sometimes not very easy to do. No, because sometimes if you have the aptitude as a player to, you know, burn and play crazy combinations of notes, sometimes to break it down to that elemental level, like, am I playing... You know, you have to asking yourself the question, what I'm playing, is that moving somebody right. when they hear me play this? You know? Yeah. I, I like to take like an uh, like a jam band, like the Allman Brothers. You know, Dickie mm-hmm. and Greg Allman. You know, th- th- those riffs that you hear like in Jessica and uh, even even uh, Ramblin' Man, you know, or uh, any of those, really. Right. They just, they're there. Right. And you hear and, them and you can sing them. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's such a, I mean, well, you know, the Allman Brothers, there's that's nothing but blues yeah. and soul and right, you know, and, just and, incredible and, musicians. <laughs> a lot of pure genius. Yeah, we were just talking about Dickie Betts the other day. Uh, when he plays, the thing we were always impressed about Dickie is that he plays continuously. He doesn't play a riff, take a slight break, play another riff. Yeah. Plays. His runs or his you know thought process when he's soloing is like this just this thing that rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and, and yeah. you know uh having having been one of those camp counselors at a um at a rock and roll fantasy camp uh dicky was one of the special guests to sit there and jam uh blue sky and ramblin man uh oh with him <laughs> that was pretty cool wow <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> that's very good it's, it's one long legato statement you yeah. know it's... Yeah, he just keeps going and going and going it's like he just takes you you know you're just on this ride with the way he plays yeah yeah, yeah. A, a ride is a very good way to explain it it's yeah. it's it's a, like a, a musical ride and know? my my thing is is that i think about like what is he thinking it's almost like chess is he 12 steps ahead like it, you know what I mean? Like because I mean it, it. Like he said, it just goes. Yeah. It just it, you can't. You know, if you're right at the moment, you got to be ahead somewhere. Yeah, I, I guess you would have to be ahead at that point because that that's just. <laughs> yeah. It's an endless it's sea so of fluid. notes. It's so yes. fluid. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's 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 it has to. One would think it would have to be thought out before it hits the fretboard. You know, and not too far ahead, but just yeah. far enough ahead. You know that you can. You can see not you can see not the next note but the next phrase, yeah. you know, and how to transition into it and that yeah that's that's guitar playing genius man, <laughs> it's just guitar playing genius absolutely. <laughs> so well, that is so cool, man. That you guys uh, that you know because I remember that first album was very different, and I was like, when the when the next uh, well when uh, once bitten came out, so that was what year was the first one eighty four was it that far back. Uh, actually, eighty three. Um, wow. The, 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 ver- the band's very first EP came out locally in Los Angeles. Uh, it was a six song EP with like the original versions of Down on Your Knees and Street Killer and Stick It and all those songs. Yeah, Street um, Killer. <laughs> that uh, actually got heavy rotation on KMET and Cal OS. So it was from that, um, you know, prelim from the from the EP that got uh, EMI interested in the first place. But they recorded in. Um, I think it was November, <coughs> pardon me, November, December of uh, 83, and then went on a tour with Priest in early 84. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Very good. good. That, would, that would have been, what, Turbo Lover or something like that? Would have been? Uh, yeah, that was the, uh, I think, no, actually, that that tour they did was the Defenders of the Faith. Yeah. Album. Well, yeah. a- around that time, Priest yeah. was huge. Oh, yeah. Know, Tur- yeah. I think Turbo was with uh, Dawkins. Oh, okay. I often say that if you can have robotic things on the stage that are like two stories tall, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, yeah, you and have a, have a Harley that uh, you're yeah, 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 kind exactly. of ride out on stage with. Yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, I saw Iron Maiden in 2001. Was it 2001? No, no, I'm sorry. It was uh, 81. I saw Iron Maiden. It was Killers. They were okay. opening up for Priest, which was point of entry. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. So it was uh, it was Iron Maiden, and they had uh, Paul Diano, the first uh, well, the first album singer. They had many singers, but that that was Paul Diano, and then after Paul came Bruce Dickinson. Right. So when they came out, it was their killers. It was their first album. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, there's Paul in the Eddie mask. 
and he has a big axe he puts it into the wood and then he rips the mask off and they do their 45 minute set right <laughs> right <laughs> Well, fast forward that to now, if you see if you see Iron Maiden, there is a radio controlled 30 foot robot that runs around on the stage <laughs> that is Eddie. And uh, there's a you know, there's like a, a group of technicians that run this thing. And I'm like, well, there there you go. And it looks like an Egyptian, you know, background and everything. It's so it's it tells you once you get to where you have robotics you you've you've done something I, i'd still rather see a crazy guy with an axe running around on stage <laughs> man, it was kind of interesting Come on, man, you know? that's fun that's anybody could have a robot nowadays i want to see a crazy dude yeah, running around and the funny part is is that paul diana was a heavy drinker so i'm sure he was wielding that axe around you know tuned up <laughs> a couple of few shots at him <laughs> That's funny. I, you know, I, I want to go into into Great White in a minute yeah, and like live sorry. thing, but I want to go back a minute um, and go back to the studio thing when when you guys were doing the the first few records. Do you remember what you were using in the studio, like you know, gear? And do you have a like favored gears, amps, mics, whatever? You know, do you have any recollection and or favorites in that genre? Well, back in that day, you know, um, I think Mark was uh, actually endorsed by Randall. But uh, in the studio, we ended up using, you know, so many of the, the you know, classic JCM 800s or 900s that were hanging about, mm -hmm. you know, in good 1960, you know, uh, 4x12s. Uh, as far as my rig or Mark's rig, you know, usually we, you know, Nobody knew about ribbons, you know, the, the use of ribbons back then. So we were primarily using like 50, SM57s and, um, you know, the occasional uh, Neumann U87 a little further off the, the speaker, you know, mm -hmm. for a little ambience. Um, that was pretty much what we used, you know, back in the day. As far as guitars, um, I have a 74 Les Paul Custom that uh, has been... Uh, quite the winner in the studio um ironically enough uh, all the old classic ballads we've ever done save your love angel song uh love is a lie uh these uh solos that mark did were on my guitar wow, um, nice. uh back in the day mark probably used i think he had a 72 custom telly that he put he dropped a humbucker in um and it was kind of a mean machine. So that that was, uh, you know, one of the things that was a go-to guitar for him. Uh, early early on when they first came in, he was having, he was rocking the white uh, Mockingbird. Oh, wow. Well, nice. Because yeah. BC, BC Rich <laughs> yeah. was, was uh, you know, very into into uh, DeMarc at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as we went along, obviously, we stretched out a little bit um, and and getting into, you know, uh, several different types of uh, Fender and Gibson type stuff. I mean, you know, it was funny because in the video for Once Been Twice Shy, for example, they, sh they see that he's playing an ES-335. But uh, actually, in the studio, we were playing a 1961 Melody Maker for that guitar sound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's just the thing. I mean, one of the other guitars I've picked up over the years in 1990, I picked up a, uh, a 52 Custom reissue by Fender, a Telecaster. Oh. And uh, that guitar is such a go-to guitar. In fact, on the last record, we just, just did Elation. Uh, between the two of us, we played probably 90% of all guitar on the record with that guitar. Really? Yeah, I mean, nice. solos and everything. I mean, he played Les Paul on one of, one of, one of the solos, and he, he played a couple solos with his, uh, Ed, his um, Ed Roman guitar. Yeah. But um, outside of that, you know, the two go-to guitars are my 52 Tele and my 74 Les Paul. <laughs> and you know what's funny about the 74 Les Paul? They're they're hugely sought after because of Randy Rhodes. Oh really? Yes. Yeah his 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 uh, custom was what, a seventy four. Was it? Yeah yeah. And you talk about a slab of wood. Mm. I mean, they yeah. Like boat I remember anchor. that being pretty heavy when I picked that up when I was about sixteen years old. It was my first real like solid electric guitar. When, you know, when I was a teenager. I mean, coming up when I was a little punk, I had a a, a Fender Duo Sonic. Oh, and then cool. I got really hip. I got an ES-330 and then 
you know, I wish obviously I still had that one, but I traded yeah. that one in for the Les Paul, and I've kept that since 1974. So, wow. you know, it's a uh, it's it's part of our family, and and it's always a workhorse. It's always there. Well, that's 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 very cool. And then you said those those two guitars are kind of like the mainstays, and most of the album was was done with those. Do you? change up rigs and, and are you using like virtual now or are you still using amps and do you change up the rig to keep it from the guitar sound getting boring after a while well you know we don't use very much virtual uh the virtual is primarily done with uh demos okay uh, because obviously Good. it's easier um mm -hmm. you know mark and i are of old school thinking that we like that sound and that feel when a guitar sound comes out of a speaker that it's actually moving some cloth Awesome. You know, there you go. Uh, yeah. We don't really think that virtual really captures that at this point. I mean, maybe in three or four more years, they might get it so down in the modeling that it emulates that thing. But to me, uh, when I hear it and the physicality of that, in, you know, the thing that's moving, you know, the cone is moving into the microphone. There is a displacement of energy that goes through the microphone. Sure. I think... You know, the guys that have played for years and have been around analog tape and all that stuff and feel that and know that, that's something that, you know, when it's for real and doing the record, we're always going to go to, um, you know, a real uh, speaker rig. The last uh, record, um, you know, over the years, we pretty much stuck with Marshalls for doing our stuff. It wasn't until a couple of records ago that we kind of stretched out. Um, on one record prior to Elation called Rising, we used a 65 amp quite frequently. Cool. Um, uh, you know, the, the the guitar player uh, for Shell Crow. Peter Stroud, yeah. yeah. Peter. Yeah, we've had yeah. Peter on. Peter has got, uh, you know, uh, a stake in that company. And it's one of those amps that if you're going for a slightly cleaner, more Mike Campbell-ish kind of approach, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a go-to amp that way. Uh, very, very boutique sounding, but also very much in that old blonde Fender thing, you know, that you can only get when you crank one of those things up. Right, right. So that was pretty cool to use that. Uh, Mark has since gotten an endorsement with Eggnator, and they came out with a prototype uh, that is one of my favorites uh, over the last couple of years. He, he hasn't... Uh, they can't sell it to him yet because they haven't built more than one, but uh, he's in wait on that one. And I like the amp so much that I'm uh, asking them to, uh, to you know, get me one of those as well. Uh, live, because we do so many fly dates, um, you know, we're just going for 900s. Um, you know, that that is kind of like uh, the go-to, you know. Mm -hmm. One thing, for the most part, you can count on them to be pretty good shape. Um you know, it's it's funny. I mean, you think about all the different amps that are out there. It's amazing, you know, what you can come up with. Uh, I've got a little five watt tube meister uh, by Hughes and Kettner in my home studio. Oh, cool! And it's re it's really cool because it can push a speaker loud enough to get that, and it's also got an XLR out for a DI sound right out of the amp. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool to mix those two things. Yeah, um, Hughes and Kettner puts the uh, the red, red box, box yeah. in their yeah. amp. Yeah, so. so it's kind of like anything you can think of. There's so many possibilities. Uh, I used to play a Saldano rig uh, mm -hmm. with one of the uh, 100 SLOs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, you know, it's been anything and everything. As far as pedals, we're not really a pedal band. We're more kind of like a, or even an amp switcher kind of band. Both, both Mark and I are volume players. You know, nice. if we need a little, little less poop out of the pickup, we'll volume <laughs> down a bit. Um, <laughs> and as far as pedals, I mean, back in the day, Mark had a Bradshaw rig, you know, with everything in there, TC electronic stuff, oh. um, you know, Yamaha stuff. Uh, all kinds of compressors and and EQ and all that crazy stuff. And it got to a point where he was getting a little far left of, of what, you know, his fingers were actually the sound they were making. So, uh, you know, I won't, I won't divulge completely what he's doing uh, with his rig because I know you guys are talking to him um, yeah. a yeah. little bit later. But he has gotten back to more old school, you know, nice. no, yeah. no, no rack mount gear, 
no monster pedal board, uh, more, more going after, uh, at the source, you know, he yeah. finally found a pickup that he's really, really happy with. Uh, and I'll, obviously I'll let him tell you about that cause he's pretty psyched. Cool. Uh, cool. But you know, it's, it's something that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you're choosing a pickup in, in my, uh, experience, you have to think about a pickup, not just from what happens with your left hand, but what happens with your right hand. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. The way you play, and everybody's different. That's what I love about, oh, well, I'll go out and buy this rig just like this guitar player, and I'm going <laughs> to end up sounding just like him. No. Uh, uh, no. How many conversations have we had like that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that's not going to happen. Right. Uh, you know, because it really, it truly is in the fingers and the hands. Yeah, and sure. he finally found a pickup that articulates uh, correctly the things and styles that he does with his right hand as he's picking, muffing, all doing all the kinds of things he does. Um, you know, it's really finally like a, like a pickup that says, okay, this was wound for Mark. Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's, that's always nice when you find something yeah. that just really puts you where you feel you want to be. Mm -hmm. sound wise you know that's yeah. that's 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 gold that now, is gold now do you guys uh use in-ears and wireless or you plug directly in and just monitors on the floor i wear in-ears uh mark is still very old school and uses a wedge and side fills mm -hmm. uh sometimes because he's not happy with the jcm 900 that we get rented that particular night his volume's going up and down trying to find that spot uh, it gets to be sometimes a little bit like the killing fields going over to his side. But, uh, you know, never quite as bad as Ted Nugent or Jakey e. Lee. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I think I'm trying to get him eventually into like a one ear, one in ear thing because, and then use the four speakers as well for supplementation because when you have the immediacy of having the one ear thing, you can really hear. The articulation of your pick mm -hmm. but at the same time you can feel like the thump of yeah, you know what, what is in the monitors and you know you don't have to you know you, because he, he can have one in the ear he can go over to the other side of the stage and not have to worry about a monitor guy following him necessarily mm -hmm. right. so he can still hear himself uh i've been on in the air since 93 and certainly one of the smarter things i ever did i mean <laughs> i i'm sure i've i've, I've saved my ears sure uh, yeah. From cymbal splash, and uh, so I mean, we don't play really loud on stage to begin with. I think a lot of guys that we roll into their town, and you know, we're using their 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 local guy and their local monitor guy. Um, they they are for the most part pretty shocked that um, our stage volume is as low as it is because we mix around the drums acoustically. Okay. Uh, so if you're standing in the center of the stage. You can hear both guitars, you can hear the bass, you can hear the kick and snare and hat. So once you've got that balance going, then it's so easy for the front of house guy to nail it because he could put everything that, that's meant to be in there. I mean, right. everything that you're putting out is supposed to be in the PA, just amplified. Right, right. So it's not that mix where the, the front of house is basically drums and vocals. Yeah. 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 You know, no, everything I... that, that comes off our stage we're getting in the front of the house because we're actually balanced from the get go on the stage. It's cool. Uh, yeah. 50, 50 waters or hundred waters. It's gotta be fifties, right? I know they're hundreds. Really? Jesus. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's believe me. That's, that's really what people have a lot of, you know, oh, yeah. and yeah. that's a consideration you have to, you have to make up for, uh, when you're out there, uh, you roll into a casino, like say, you know, play the hard rock and Biloxi. Um, the backline company that's provided there, you know, you send them out your rider, uh, amps, drums, keyboard, bass rig, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything that you would possibly need to put on a show. Um, and then you, you know, I get on the phone with these guys and make sure they've got what we need. Um, every once in a while, they'll say, well, can you use the GK for the bait? Yeah, sure. You know, it's okay. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's, the consistency that we can achieve in an inconsistent scenario is basically, right. yeah. you know, why we go for the 900s all the time because we know that everybody has them. And yeah. for the most part, they're maintained pretty well. So 
we don't get too many dogs. Right, uh, that's good. As far as 900s go. Um, you know, you were talking about wanting to get into what what a typical day is. You know, we don't carry any crew with with, uh, with the band. Oh, wow. So you're going to you're going to you're going to flip when you hear this. Our bass player Scott kind of sets up the back line. You know, our drummer Audie pretty much sets up his own kit, you know, from scratch mm-hmm. every day. Um I go over, and because I have so many sound cards for like Yamaha M7s or PM5Ds or the Digi stuff, uh, you know, we've got mixes, save them on a USB jump drive. You know, I send that in advance. They'll have an input list. They'll set it. They'll they'll basically wire it. Then I'll go over and dial in the monitors for everybody. So at the end, you know, by the time we go and play, the monitor guy basically he's got. A babysit kit. <laughs> well, <laughs> just to make sure it's working. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mark takes care of our guest list. Audie takes care of the merchandise. I do all the, uh, the tour managing. So we are completely a self-contained entity. Wow. wow. But at the end of the day, I'll, I'll tell you guys, you know, walking home with a little more cake in the pocket does not suck. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for yeah. Sure. Do you um do you take the the seventy four out? Oh gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what are you taking out now? Uh, what I'm taking out right now is I just picked up last. Uh, gosh, I think it was like September. Um, I bought one of those Les Paul signatures that have the um the fifteen dB boost in them. Okay. With the, uh, if you go up to the rhythm pickup and you pull the knob, it makes it split coil. So it makes it as close to a strat for a clean tone as I can possibly get. Like on a song like House of Broken Love, um, you know, it's that real crystalline kind of telly strat kind of sound. So it'll go there. And the other one's got a very nice, um, you know, like, uh, sounds a lot like a 59. Hmm in the in the bridge position uh and can you can go there to get the uh to get the scream if you need it um and you know it's 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 worked great for me the guitar plays great it's not particularly expensive uh but it looks great plays great and sonically everybody in the band's happy with it and cool it's only it's only a guitar that's like 1800 dollars that i don't worry about having to take out i never take out my my uh, Telly or my Les Paul. I even have a 65 Strat that never leaves the house. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a 65 Strat replica of that that I occasionally switch out with the Les Paul, depending on the type of set we're doing. You know, if we're changing a set drastically and it needs, you know, something a little bit less heavy, mm-hmm. then I'll go for either a Strat, you know, and I have several Tellys as well in different configurations that have seen the light of day. Wow. Cool. Well, it, you know, I mean, it um, it sounds like a pretty great gig at this point. You know, no, uh, it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of pressure. You know, and there's not a whole lot of overhead. And no, you know, it it really sounds like a very cool gig. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind having that. We do, we just keep doing it, and you know, and we're you know writing material for a new record right now. We're hopefully going to start recording in March and and get it done when we can get it done as opposed to being on some insane breakneck schedule uh cool. because we're going to have dates you know in between all of that all the time um just because we like to work so That's we're nice. fortunate nice. enough that people still want to book the band and uh, we do between 60 and 70 shows a year or so uh, you know financially it's as good as uh, as if we had done uh, 150 city bus tour right nice. with, with full crew and everything yeah, yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a lot less havoc on your on your body and certainly uh you have you know two or three days home every week because yeah. you only play it basically on the weekends right yeah uh so you can have some assemblage of a family life you know that that's, that's a positive yeah. to that I mean, for you know for being a rock and roll guy that's that's a that's a, a good pretty schedule. civilized gig, man. Yeah. It really is. Because, I mean, people think the road is glamorous. It's not. <laughs> well, it's so not. It, it's like with the conversation we had with Joe Holkstra, where he's doing 400 gigs a year. And one of the questions that both Jeff and I had was, how do you stay healthy? 
Yeah. You know, it was like we needed to know his diet because the guy must be a machine <laughs> right. for and, 400 gigs a year. He can't sleep very much. And, you know, it's so. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's ridiculous yeah. how much Joel works. But, you know, he is so great. Oh, that, my God. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things where you just go, yeah, I get it. You know, <laughs> um, but, you know, we we run into each other. I mean, one of the first things he ever did when he just got a Night Ranger was work on Jack Blade's solo record. And Jack had called me over to do some engineering on that record. Uh, so that was the first time I ever worked with Joel. So he was like, God, you know, I know you're back with Great White now. And I just missed playing with you in Night Ranger. And I was like, it's, so it's kind <laughs> nice. of one of those things that uh, that uh, we've always, we always seem to run into each other. And we're always talking about how hard we're working. So God bless us for that. You Absolutely. Know? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Man. You know, you're you're both out there still doing it, and yeah. uh, and that's great, man. We'll we'll um we'll have to keep an eye out if you guys happen to hit the uh, East Coast anytime. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sure we will. I mean, you know, we're just at that point in in every year's cycle that our agent is calling me every you know two or three times a day, going, uh, here's the gig, here's the here's the parameters, here's the deal. Do you want to accept it? And, uh, you know, of course, you know, when it, when it works and it's great, yeah. you just say, yeah, let's go for it. Sure. Uh, so many dates are coming in. This is that time of year where our calendar starts to fill up, thank goodness. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, the East Coast, I'm, you know, sure we got Jersey. I know we're we're looking at something in Maryland for a big bike fest coming up uh, before the summer. Oh, and yeah. uh, cool. so, cool. you know, we've, we've got some stuff. Well, cool. We'll probably, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to wind up uh, running into you at the uh, Maryland gig. Yeah, because we can yeah. bring this to you. Oh, yeah, there you totally. go. That'd be great to hang out with you guys, man. Yeah, yeah man. for sure. Well, Michael, uh, we unfortunately we do have to wrap, but thank you so very much for taking the time. We really do appreciate it, and uh, continued success and fun on the road this coming spring and summer, man. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll look forward to running into you guys. Have a great show, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. All right. Cheers. Well, there you have the story. You know, yeah, Mr., uh, the story of Mr. Michael Lardy. Yeah, that kid, uh, he's done a lot. He has, you know, and, and you know, he, um, and it's so cool that he's, he's self-taught and everything and, um, but actually went to school for engineering, which yeah. I thought was very, very cool. And just think if he hadn't watched uh, the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. He well, may you be know, working on us as a doctor. That, that show changed the lives of more how many soon to be musicians. Yeah. How many people have we talked to now that reference that that reference that exact moment? Yep. That is the most bizarre thing ever. That I, tells you one thing how, about the Beatles. Yeah. That, you know, there, there were four of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, there were. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, there were five. But <laughs> poor Pete, <laughs> he forgot to stay in the yeah, band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, it's funny because it's always this thing of like, well, what do you like, the Stones or the Beatles? Oh, everybody always asks time. that, right? Yeah. But I would put my money on the Beatles making more rock and roll than the Stones just for the fact of that that night there must have been thousands upon thousands of guitar players and musicians born right at that moment. I Well, yeah, I mean, you would have to attribute it more so to the Beatles. I mean, you know, of course, there's there's the Beatles camp and there's the the Stones camp. Yes. Um, but who influenced you more? If you were there and you were watching from the beginning, the answer to that would probably have to be the Beatles because they were the first ones on. Um, right, unless you missed that that Ed Sullivan show. But Nobody you know, missed by, television by the, back then, <laughs> right? It would sit around seven o'clock on a Sunday and you know, in front of the black and white TV and, and pray to God go. the electricity's working. That's right. <laughs> You know, and the, and the and the foil is the right way on the yeah. on the antenna. But Nobody was YouTubing back then. No, no. But it's like by the time the stone and I remember the progression. I think we might have covered this before, but I remember the progression of bands that really influenced me on the Ed Sullivan show. And it was, of course, the Beatles first, yep. and then the Stones, then the Dave Clark Five. There you, you go. Know, it was, it, and they, they weren't. I don't think they were back to back to back, but they were close enough that it was that was my time reference. You know, yeah. Yeah. so you know. As far as if you're in the Beatles camp or you're in the Stones camp, that's that's your musical preference. Yeah. But unless you miss that Beatles show, there's no way that anybody's going to say the Stones influenced me because a week or two before you saw the Beatles, you know, the Stones might have gone further into cementing yes. your idea of being a, a musician, you yep. know, but the Beatles probably trick, tripped at first, you know. Yeah, it seems to be the uh, consensus there yeah, with, with that. I think so. Uh, we've hit a, I don't know, I'd have to go back and actually listen 
to the other shows, but I just, I, that's the only thing I keep hearing. Uh, it, it really is <laughs> one of the more constant references. Oh, the Beatles. Uh, you know, oh, you Beatles. know, that, it's all of them. that is going to change as this generation of guys that are in our age bracket, uh, you know, as they start to fade out and we Pass start, on. we start interviewing the younger guys. That story is going to change, of course. It's not going to be, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It's going to be, uh, my brother listened to Zeppelin records or something. You know, you hear that story, too. Oh, yeah. It's, it's and gonna, then that, that generation will go away. And, and it's going to be Eddie. Yeah. It'll be Eddie. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It'll be Eddie. It'll be, uh, uh, then it gets weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see, who are the big ones after that? You know, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you, you go. You could have those guys. And then after that group, it'll be Corn. Yeah. And, uh, and then Red Beans. And Rice. And Rice. Yeah, who knows? Well, I Red Beans know. and Rice, they were a duo. They broke up, and now it's just Red Beans <laughs> and Rice. So. <laughs> I haven't seen either one of those, so I, I cannot comment no. you know, as to the musical quality. <laughs> but I, you know, Michael, Michael, done well for himself. I mean, he didn't even mention things like you know when he was in the studio. He he, it, when he was in engineering and producing, you know, he was he was working with like Black Flag and Kaja Gugu and hmm. Dokken and people wow. like that. So, you know, he um he's he's done more than he uh, mentioned when he was on yeah. the show, but. Um, it's pretty funny how he kept going back to to Mark. He kept referencing Mark in the interview. It was yeah, it was, yeah it's yeah. all about Mark's guitar tone. So it tells you that he's a he's a good um, um, he's a team player. Yeah, he's like a is he a utility man? Would you call him a utility guy? Because he does the guitar and the keyboards and yeah, and you know, I would say that, and I would say that with with the utmost of respect absolutely you yeah, know he's i not... mean no i mean he is an official part of that band yes. at this point you know yeah um but yeah i mean but he's that well-rounded guy he's that guy that does absolutely. all the stuff that needs to be done that you know that fills in those gaps I absolutely guess. and and you know those guys um no shortage of work for those kind of guys that you know the ones that choose to go to another band once this particular tour is done and yeah you know they yeah. go to another band uh, those guys are hired up all the time if they're in the circle because you know sure they're they're they know they know the rigors of the road mm -hmm. you know and they're multi instrumentalists and you know the the good ones are team players and they just know how to be where they're supposed to be and do what they're supposed to do and that's not to say they're not having a shit ton of fun while no, they're doing and, it and know? without any roadies they're uh they're making a little coin on that side there which oh, is kind of wild yeah that's great man that you know so. Look, yeah. uh, here's the thing. I always say, I you know, especially today. Years ago, it was different, but today, the prima donna thing, you got to leave that crap at the door. You yeah. cannot bring that to the table. People will look right through it. It's just like this podcast. You know, if I ignored the emails, if you ignored the Facebook things, if we ignored that stuff, we'd be talking to each other right now, and that would be it. Because, you know, people like that interaction. That's why mm -hmm. they're in this medium. This medium, you got to interact. Right. And it's it they. It's funny because I heard Adam Carolla talking about this, and I'll make it quick, but he, he talked about how they feel like they're part of the show. You know, they know us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we may not know them, but they listen to us every episode. They start to know us. And when they approach us, it'll be either through email or when we ever do a live show, it'll be, right. you know, and, and it's different now because it is, you're so much more connected to the person that's doing right. the and thing. And there are so many more people connected. It's crazy. You, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's like a network that just breathes and lives on its own. Right. You know, and when now musicians have to, you know, guys, I imagine it's very difficult for guys that went through those years in the 80s and the 90s when it was big stages, lots of security, crazy. You know, it was just nuts. And you mm -hmm. were playing for huge houses. And, and you were stuff. bigger than life. Yeah, you were. You Absolutely. were untouchable. Right. You know, and you had to you had to beg, bar and steal just to try to meet one of these guys. You know, mm -hmm. you had to wait around for hours on end. Now it's like you go see anybody and they and I, they do cattle calls and they, yeah, but, but i mean still it, it takes it generally in, in in much larger acts it you're not going to meet most of those people you know you're not no but 
most of those people are now more interactive with their fans, maybe not on a, you know, grin and grip or face to face kind of, you know, handshake and sure. basis. The social media. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, people expect them to be a little more interactive. Now, is, is, are all of them totally interactive? No. And I, no. and I get that. You, yeah. you can't be. It would, well, you, you know, know, you can't be on 24 seven. It would drive you crazy. I, as somebody as hardworking as Joel Hoekstra is. Mm hmm. I watch his Twitter feed. You know, we we follow him and we see it, and I retweet things for from him and stuff. It's amazing to me how many people he responds to. Really? Yeah. I wow. mean, that dude is definitely connected. You know, so and that's what we do. Yeah, we're connected. We you you send us something, we'll respond to it. Right. We may not be right away. You got to bear with me. I do have a day job, and, and we try to <laughs> connect you with these other people. You know, through the podcast. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, we do what we can. You know, yes. we do what we can. And that's all we can do, you know, and we'll keep doing it until next time. That's right. So until next time. Ah, gotcha. I know. <laughs> threw me a hook. <laughs> I'm Mick Marcelino. That's right, because I'm Jeff Bober. He did it again. And we are saying. <laughs> Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter at Amson Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening.